The time is 11.01 Pacific Standard Time on Friday. I'm here with Mark Skaggs. Mark, could you, could you briefly describe your past, present, and potentially future occupation? Sure. Um, why don't we start with uh, what I went to school for, which is computer engineering. All right. Jumped out of that and started making software for the chip designers in Texas Instruments. Did that for a couple of years and then went to make desktop publishing software. We're a small developer in Texas working on a project called Freehand for all this uh, and fun talking for old back stuff. After that, I decided uh, to get an MBA. And when I finished my MBA, I started a game company. I've been making games ever since. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, cool. So your current position, could you please describe your current responsibilities and how long you've been in this position and any past positions you feel are very important to highlight. Okay, sure. Uh, so right now I'm leading a team that's, in, uh, uh, that's making a mobile product called Empire's Analyze. In a larger context, uh, my role at Zynga is involved into the guy that makes new games. And that means starting from scratch with no team, no ideas, sometimes no tech and building something and getting it into the market. Relevant to that, the way that I got into this position of doing this is just all the previous uh, years of making games at my own game company and working for Virgin and Westwood and working for Electronic Arts. So it's sort of this is the end result of all of that work. Hmm. Interesting. So it sounds like a culmination of where you've been and where you are now. Excellent. All right, cool. It's a, it's a hard thing to start. It's, it, you probably have a sense of this. It's a hard thing to start uh, any project from scratch with no team, no idea, no tech, um, and getting going and, and working. So there's a lot of trust in my ability to do so. That trust comes from the past work and success I've done, plus the long tenure in the industry. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, since this... Uh I'm not, I might not do this in the exact order because it kind of flows better. So what would you say, based on your past experiences and stuff like that, what would you particularly highlight? Anything you're particularly proud of? Any teams, projects, titles that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, of course, every team project is different. Yep. And when you're able to work with one team or a core set of people over multiple projects, it just makes it that much more special. And so... Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is the team that we had in Irvine there, which was part of uh, part of originally Virgin and Westwood, and then they became part of EA with the acquisition. Mm -hmm. That group was the set of people we made. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that were there before we started or working on Red Alert 2, but the Red Alert 2 slash Generals team I then moved into the battle for Middle Earth team. We had a lot of people that continued tenure across all those three games. So that was a real special moment in time. Uh, and I think generals is throughout the culmination of that. And what I mean by that is you get a group of people together, you learn a bunch of collective lessons, and then you, you, you build a product, and then you go on to make your next one where you take all those lessons you've learned and capitalize on them. And, you know, generals is throughout which is the right moment in time, uh, time in the industry, time for the game team, time for electronic arts in this case. So that's one thing. I think two other call outs and highlights would be. I'm working at Zynga on Farmville. Again, uh, you know, I'm a believer that the product's a reflection of the team. And when you look at the products like Farmville or even Cityville, which came after it, you got a real special teamwork working on those things. You guys are dedicated, you guys who know their craft, and you guys who want to win. So those, those are some really big highlights. Excellent. Now, yeah, and that's in the past. Now this team, when I partners and allies, same kind of thing, a lot of super... Uh, veterans, people who made RTS games, of course, some have some people with mobile experience, but all very dedicated to winning, winning the long game, right? Not just doing an assignment and getting it done, but winning in the market, winning with players, making an awesome experience. All right. Well, that actually ducktails into another question on um, how has technology really changed your your job and marketing over time? Because it sounds like you know it's definitely evolved. So it, it, you know, and and you've definitely been around for a lot of that and actually set that standard and mold. So I just want to get your perspective on you know how has technology either limited you or in the future it's going to make your job a lot easier. Yeah, I think the way I look at it is technology is just a delivery plate for your game to the player, right? And 
my job is to find out first off, you know, how to use that technology. So, you know, the first game I ever made was on the 3D machine way, way, way back. Um, you know, the whole platform didn't work, but that was like where I was learning how to make games. You know, it was PlayStation 1, then it was PC, and then it was web, and now it's mobile. And so having the perspective of seeing all of those changes, mm -hmm. we kind of became agnostic to the, the feeling like, wow, this platform is, is bad because it can't do what the last one did. Hmm. This one is awesome now because I can put so many poly or poly sprites or whatever on the screen at once and instead look and say, for example, with mobile, how are people using this technology? What game do I give them that fits the technology, their lifestyle, and their usage? So it's, it's a weird sort of combination of technology is important, but you got to craft your experience to fit how players are using that technology. Hmm. Excellent. Now, now that's that's more on the user end, and I, I I really like that. But at the same time, the other part of that question is, how do you think technology has changed your job, your specific oh. role as a producer, Zach? And then you know, you know, no, no, it's yeah. So just you know, different aspects of that question. Yeah. So um, it affects you know probably the first starting point is it affects the people that are on the team. You know, obviously we're working on Marvel One. It was web. It was flash. We didn't need any 3D. Um, it was real simple. What the players needed at that point was a very simple, fast game. So we were looking for that side of you know, the technology. Can can the person code fast? Do they know how to create backend server infrastructure? Can they get uh, flash to work really fast and understand how that works? On the design side of that, you know that that game didn't support deep, rich, intense design. So we had to get a set of people who. Maybe you got to do that type of design, but also really got the fact that keeping it simple was the most important thing. Okay. So now on web and mobile, uh, you know, sorry, on mobile, the technology is such that it's almost like you need to be have the skill and experience from console experience in terms of uh, managing performance really intensely, looking at uh, download size and memory size, a lot of stuff that's familiar not to, uh, to consoles. But now in a much smaller form factor, and that just determines who's on your team, who you hire, what you have to learn, the skill sets, and how you can give the app to players. Gotcha, gotcha. Speaking of that, what what challenges would you say that that you kind of face on a regular basis when you come into work and and go like, okay, hey, what do you usually hit with, and what do you usually kind of work on? Gotcha. Yeah, the, um, my role right now, uh, and, and it varies over time. Of course, uh, yeah. the, you know, I would call it producer side of things. Yeah. Sometimes it's creative producer, sometimes it's project manager producer. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I my goal is, is to make sure everybody on the team has clarity on where I want us to go with the project. So that's step one. And you know, you go, that shit can you just establish it once and then you're done? Well actually what happens is you establish the high level vision and then you're always continually refining the details. And once you have the certain set of done, you know, sort of features and details done, like say for soft launch, uh, then you're ready to take on the next set of things, which is like, okay, how are we going to prepare for wide launch? What features need to be in there? What bugs and stuff do we have to fix? Or what new lessons have we learned in the soft launch period that we need to apply and fix or change as we go to worldwide? So getting everybody in clarity on those things, then helping solve problems. Um, so we've been around a lot, have seen a lot of things happen. Um, you know, things, I have to say, it's like games don't want to be made. Right? You can divide them all up, get them all planned, and then something goes wrong, and it's like, man, if, if this stuff would just stay on track, we'd be golden. That's just, that just never happens. So we solve problems, um, whether that's people problems, or tech problems, or, you know, maybe the, something as simple as Apple submission is taking three days longer than planned. Well, how does that work now with all the rest of the Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was just going to say a comment. Yeah, that, that kind of throws off your schedule potentially because yeah. you're, now you're sitting there waiting, like, okay, I, I'm waiting for the publisher. You know, and you're like, oh, God. Right. And then, yeah. yeah solving those kind of things and dealing with it. Um, you know, if I had to say the third part of this, and now in my role, uh, which is, again, I've been here for a long time, yep. is connecting with different parts of the organization that will help us uh, in their own roles to make product, whether it's QA, 
finance or marketing and it's two steps making sure they understand the mission and where we're going so they can do their job well, but also the, how the services that we use from their groups, how that's all coordinated and it's Gotcha, gotcha. Now, I, I'm curious, when you walk in and, and you're con- conducting this and you're going to these different people, how do you usually do it? What's your usual style? Do you send emails or do you just go you know, find them on the next floor? Or you know, what does your like, day-to-day kind of look like when you're engaging these people? Yeah, it, it really depends on, on the situation in the teams. But it's just pure information exchange. Like, here's the information you've asked for. Uh, like our player testing and insight. We want to. Uh, we want to work with them. And say it's a good idea to, to run some idea by a set of focus group or a set of players. We'll have that meeting in person, good conversation, and then if the follow up is, can you send us send us a list of the top ten ideas? That goes through email. And what I found is that it's kind of like an efficiency equation. Once you get to know the people that you're working with, then short emails can work. But while you're establishing that, you know. Uh, relationship and understanding who they are and what their goals are. It's always best if you can do that face to face. And you know, you you wing it, wing it from there. Now, if there's a problem, obviously going face to face is yeah. the better answer always. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there any goals or expectations that you have either for yourself or others or your overall organization or any of your past organizations oh, sure. that you've been a part of? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's just stop. We'll start at the organization and product side. All right. Um, Yeah, yeah. Next question I have is: um, um, Are there any key qualities that you think are very that are, that that are very important into getting where you are now, or just being part of a producer? Yeah, um, always. And this is you, know, you can go look up the science and research on this. The number one determination, the determiner, determinant of success is what they call grit. And that's ah, the yes. Ability, right? it's, yeah, I remember this. Hard stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was on a TED talk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. Go on. So that is it. It, it is. I can speak most, uh, you know, with the most information about the game industry, but I saw it a little bit in um, other industries and other other businesses I've looked at, where it's the ability to go, set your plan, set your goals, and understand it's going to be harder than you expect, and to keep at it and push through the resistance, the friction, or whatever else is getting in your way and the ability to bounce back when you get hit with something unexpected that's not fun and keep going and you know the other piece of the equation the flip side the other side of that coin is also the ability to have perspective to listen to other people who can tell you hey you've got a blind spot here um, you're going to keep banging your head on that wall why don't you look up and just 
took a round. Next one is for producers. And, and I'm going to call this drive or the, the desire, internal desire to make stuff happen and make good things happen, make a mark, you know, show off, show some really great stuff, make things happen that nobody else expects is possible. And the reason I say that is because as a producer, it's one of the hardest to define jobs in the game industry. Mm. Because it basically means do everything necessary to get this project done. One day you might be talking to legal people about an outsourcing agreement. The next day you might be looking at how we pull all this art and coordinate all the art getting into the game with inside of the memory footprint, the download footprint that you have. Um, and, and the next day it could be working on a schedule with the engineering manager to try to coordinate the engineering work with the design work with the artwork. Uh, and so you're going to have this drive to make things happen, not just manage the stuff. There's a key thing in my belief is that, you know, the difference between leadership and management is, and I heard this story, uh, and it's probably out of uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, nice, yeah. I still have to get to that. Yeah, it's a good book. It, it, it's just a story where, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a little lucky, it tells that, you know, Manager, you, know, you got a crew of workers chopping uh, their way through a jungle, chopping a path through a jungle. The managers to make sure their machetes are sharp, they all have water, they do stretching exercises before so they don't hurt their backs, they get fed well, they all get eight hours of sleep. The leader is the guy who climbs the tree and says, hey, we're going the wrong way. Right? So the idea of producer as not just the manager making sure all the ducks in a row, but as a leader who can say, here's where we want to go. You've got a great designer and his ideas are this. Let's, you know, here's how we're going to make those happen. And, and, and kind of busting through that version. So those are, I think, are the key aspects. Excellent, excellent. What do you hope to see evolve in your industry in the next 10 years? Wow, that's a giant question. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I, what I hope to see or what I kind of expect to see, my, my sense is that uh, you're going to see, and somebody was talking about this earlier, maybe it was uh, Eric Schmidt from Google saying, the internet's going to disappear. And, and by that, uh, I think people are going to stop worrying about are they connected, how fast is the connection, and we'll just get into this device, whether it's a phone or an earpiece or you know, some kind of cool watch thing. This device becomes almost their connection to the world. I'm not saying exclusive to other people, not a cyberpunk thing at all, but more like they're not going to think twice when their watch pops up and says, by the way, traffic today is heavy. It happens to do it at the point that you're ready to walk out of the office and drive home. Right? And it's going to be this is natural and normal. You know, the ability for your contacts on your phone to just automatically migrate to whatever device you're using without you worrying about. It. Now, for the game side of things, on the mobile and device, you know, I think we're going to be for a while uh, stuck with the form factor or something in your hand that you look at. Who knows, will the, you know, the Microsoft HoloLens or will the Oculus change the world? Probably so. But I think most average everyday people are for a while going to be using the form factor of a phone or tablet in their hands. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. That kind of covers most of my formal questions. Do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, we do have four minutes until the 25 minute mark. I want to give these other two people a chance to kind of reflect and ask you questions as well. Sure. Um, well, why don't we start with the questions if you guys have any, and then I'll think about some closing thoughts when we go that. All right. Matt? Um, not, uh, just not very many questions on my side. Uh, I just am very grateful for you to be here today. Um, so it's kind of an honor for me. So, uh, yeah, I definitely have, uh, I'm, I'm wanting to, uh, join more of the artist side. So maybe not necessarily producers, but, uh, definitely making things is, okay. is my, my, uh, bit there. Okay. Uh, it definitely, you have definitely directed me toward, uh, a goal. Uh, uh -huh. so that at least kind of gives me an idea of what I need to do to be able to achieve the goals that I need. Okay. Let me, on, on that front, let me share a thought. And you know, the word artist triggered something for me. Uh, I learned a really cool lesson from Brent Sperry at Westwood. And it's the difference between an artiste and a craftsman. An artiste is a person who has a vision inside of themselves. They have to get out to the world. And the idea is that vision is so strong, they have to express it in the form of a game or a, a piece of art or jewelry or something like that. Um, and that's great. And 
And when I first started making gig, I was the artiste. But the craftsman is a guy who looks around and says, what does everybody want? What are they buying? What do I feel like I want to do that in relation to that? And then he makes something that people want to buy already. And, and for example, the craftsman looks around and saying, everybody now is buying wooden chairs. I'm going to make a wooden chair. The best wooden chair ever. It's going to be amazing. It's going to have a lot of you know, style to it and art to it, but it's going to be what people want to buy. So my encouragement is, you guys are thinking about your careers and your games today. Because you think about that craftsman side, and, you know, that lesson was really brought home for me. When I had made, I think it was like five or six games when I was first starting in my career, and they all sucked. They weren't very good. Some of them were technically well executed. Some of them had some cool design ideas. But when I say they sucked, the sales were nothing, not enough to sustain a business on. Then I had the opportunity to work on Red Alert 2, and I almost turned it down because I was too much of an artiste. I was like, I don't know, I don't know if I should ever do sequels. But I, I, I gave in with a lot of Brent's encouragement, and because I loved Red Alert 1. Well, I had gone from a set of games that didn't sell very much. I think the largest, the biggest sales was about 80,000 units or 8,000 copies. To making Red Alert 2 that sold 3 million copies. And I'm like, all right, there's a lesson here. What did people already want? They wanted an RTS game. They wanted it in this universe. They already had one. They wanted another one. Follow that thread. Follow that vein. And, um, you know, that vein of riches. And go for it. So that's something I'd encourage you guys to think about, especially as you're starting out. All right. Very good. Do, uh, James? No, that, that kind of covered everything I wanted to talk about too. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, because well, I'm kind of I'm kind question. of like the the, okay. the artistic kind of person. And I, I like to create things, so you know that kind of covered what I yeah. wanted to talk about too. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> let, me, let me hit on another real world example because I think the artiste versus the craftsman is so critical. It's hard to get. Um, I was talking with this person that I know and. Uh, she said, look, my daughter is in the jewelry business, and she's trying to figure out how to get her business started. You're creative. Can you talk to her? And, and I, I talked to this woman, and she was talking about how her designs in her jewelry were unique and amazing. And she was pissed off because when she, when she looked out in the marketplace, she saw everybody buying one style that was very simple and kind of beneath her to make. Hmm. And I turned to her and I said, look, um, if your goal as a jewelry maker is to have as many people as possible to experience your jewelry because it makes them happy, because it's cool, why don't you look at those designs that other people are doing that you're kind of, you know, looking down your nose at? Why don't you make your version of that? Take it. Bring your style to it. Bring your sensibilities to it. And that might give you a way out of this by toiling forever making a bunch of cool stuff that nobody's buying. So... There's that. All right. Well, we have five minutes before it's the half an hour mark. Did you have any questions for any of us or just, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, why we're here today? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, why don't you give just a quick a couple minutes summary of uh, this project and what's going on? Okay. Well, basically, for this current project, it's called, I don't know if you've ever heard of industrial organizational psychology. Sure. Basically, it's for those people who haven't, I just call it business psychology. Instead of business applied to business, it's a psychology applied to business. So it, it tries to really look at it from the human perspective instead of the bottom line perspective. And it really comes from and goes into uh, HR, recruiting, management, and, and tries to incorporate psychology into into the workplace more effectively, more efficiently, so that uh, workers show up and they want to be there instead of going to it, going into a nine to five going, I have to be here because I'm being paid a million dollars. And, and you know what? I can't afford not to have this job. And then they sit in a job going, I hate, I hate this. I hate myself, but I need the money to survive. You right. know? And I, I actually saw, I was actually doing some preliminary research when I was you know, getting ready to interview. And I saw you had a blog and you were talking about something similar in which you were saying you, you had a, uh, or your own website, not a blog, but your personal website, and you're talking about, you know, the the difference is like, hey, I don't mind, you know, you know, go do your passion, you know, and then at the very end, you were like, you know, but 
one caveat is, you know, if making money is your passion, then you kind of have this weird loop of my passion is making money. But what's your passion? My passion is making money. But how do you? I don't care. It's just making money. So it's like you know, hey. So it's kind of weird. But that's yeah. kind of. Okay. No, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was say, one, one of the things that you did on there is um, to, to two quick thoughts before yeah. we end up here. Producer Pyro, one thing that makes a great producer mm. is understanding those psychological factors, understanding things at a human level, because your job is often to go to someone and say, "Hey, by the way." Um, how are you coming along with that art because you really need it tomorrow mm. and the way that you approach them and you talk to them respect them respect their craft respect their expertise yeah. great producers know that and they work and develop that skill uh, on the second thing is I uh, I'm kind of one of those people here, here's what I actually believe your passion what you're doing is like an extra fuel or a booster that's going to get you through those hard times and if you take two people who have the same skill and set of skill, one has passion about the work he's doing and the other one doesn't, that's going to be reflected in the results. You know, the product is a reflection of the team, the product is a reflection of the individual. Mm-hmm. And it's going to show up, maybe not in a way of, wow, that code is better or, you know, that artwork is you know, so much better, but it's going to show up in this feeling about the work. It's, you can tell when the artist or the craftsman or the engineer loves what they're doing, it just comes out in it. And that comes from, hey, I'm going to set it, stay an extra 10 minutes tonight because I really want to get this right because I love what I'm doing. And it's those little differences there that is fueled by passion, which often make it, you know, just this determination between success and failure. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Because I was actually – there's a video game design club here at UC Irvine, and wow. and I was talking. Um, they, they were like, anybody want to share any of their experiences? This was Wednesday night. And I was like, okay. So then I was like – I stood up and I talked a little bit, and I was like, you got to think in terms of systems. But at the same time, you need to kind of know where you fit in this entire system of whether it's an actual – your skills and abilities, systems that you're trying to figure out, or the teams. And I was kind of thinking like – Basically, the one thing that I think school is, doesn't really emphasize but that people need to kind of figure out is who they are. To boil it down, how can, how can somebody make something and push it out to the rest of the world and have them you know, receive it if they're paying for it good or if they're not? You know, just for, how can they have a product if they don't know themselves? As you said, it is a reflection and it, it becomes a struggle because then someone goes, well, hey – I." I I like your. I like what you did. What's what's the message in that? And then if you respond, there is no message. It's just something I did. You know, there is right. no reason behind it. it yeah. It's just something I had to do. They, then they go, oh. Yeah, that's like when somebody calls up uh, a radio show to talk to their famous uh, famous musician, their you know, musician they really love. They say, tell me what you were thinking when you wrote this song. Hmm. You know, uh, yeah. people really want to hear the story behind things. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. I'm just letting you know that this is the half an hour half an hour mark. So if you have to go, Mark, I, I totally understand. Actually, I do have to go, and thanks for keeping so tight on the time. No, yeah, no, of course, because you know that's what you expect, and that's what needs to be done as a producer. <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how you got to schedule your time. You know, if you had time to talk for hours with the people that you needed to and wanted to, that then nothing would really move forward effectively and efficiently. So thanks a lot, Mark. Really. Okay. Really appreciate thanks, it. Yeah, enjoy the talk. All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your time, okay. man. Bye, guys. Bye. Later. Bye. We're done. Uh, recording terminated. The oh, before recording terminated, the sit-ins are Doom Tanker, James, and Fandor Matt.